forget, forgotten genocide concept. Should we call it probably hidden genocide? Why not? Why was it forgotten? Who did the forgetting? Did you ask yourself a question? How did it happen? After all, we are not talking with a dozen of folks, you know, with a dozen of people, or women, or orphans. We are talking about literally millions of people. Okay, let me put it that way. Let me try to tone down. Uh, according to statistics, even if you look in the German Koblenz star, uh, state, state archive, state archive, in the state archive, you will find out that approximately between 12 to 15 million Germans were expelled put it euphemistically, or kicked out, if you wish, or thrown out, expelled from Eastern Europe and Russia in the period, during the period from 45 to 55 almost. I don't know how many of you realized that ethnic Germans, or if you want to call them Volksdeutschen, lived not just in Eastern Europe, or for that matter, Donau Swabian, a million and a half in this Donau Bay Basin, and we'll come to that in a second, but there were also ethnic Germans who lived in Asia, in Kazakhstan. Just a while ago, a month ago, I was in Stuttgart and I met a, ni a nice lady, a very intelligent lady. And she told me, look, Tom, I, uh, Mr. Sonika, I just come from Kazakhstan and I, in fact, you know, according to the uh, German laws, a person relocating to Germany from Eastern Europe is automatically entitled to German citizenship. This does not apply to American, um, uh, German Americans born here or in Argentina or in Chile. They cannot do that. But a person of German ancestry, if he was born in Kazakhstan, which is close to Afghanistan, by the way, so you can imagine where the Germans have been scattered over centuries throughout the whole world. We'll come to that. They are entitled, they still have this concept, the, the judicial concept of jus sanguinis. In other words, if you are of blood, of your German blood, then you are entitled to your German passport, which wouldn't, to most of you, ap apply here if you were born in the United States of America. Anyway, I'm still a little bit confused and a little bit intrigued and mystified with this forgotten, forgotten genocide. Who did the forgotten? After all, let's keep in mind that uh, the Titoists in October when they captured Belgrade, or if you wish, liberated, to put it more euphemistically, then uh, they were massively supplied by weapons and hardware. By who? By the Americans, you know, by the English. They were getting lots and lots of weapons and food stuff and everything. So if, let's say, if the, if the communists, if the Tito is played dumb, okay, let's, just, let's give them a due credit. If they were truly dumb, well, somebody else knew, at least those airborne folks, you know, they knew what was going on. So I'm quite certain, and hopefully so, if we are truly involved now here in some academia, in academic free speech and academic research, to put it that way, I'm sure that we could probably dig up some interesting cons uh, documents, either at the Naval War Academy or in Washington, D.C., or in the Congressional Library, which for a variety of reasons haven't surfaced, on which for a variety of reasons have been hidden. Okay? <laughs> so this is just my comment, but I guess it's worth making an effort. So I guess that's, that's the, what this conference is all about. We want to make an intellectual <coughs> effort to see to what extent this is just an inflated uh, sentimental story about people suffering in those camps, about 40,000 German kids, 40,000 German kids who disappeared and who were adopted by Serbish or Serbian parents or Macedonian parents who were completely, how can I say, whose uh, national consciousness was completely deleted and who turned into Yugoslavs. And then, uh, or, or, should we, or should we just leave it aside and just look at this as an exotic uh, polka type of uh, event that we can sometimes resuscitate during our get-together? Because let's not forget, when we talk about those victims, we are talking about what? Victimologies, dear friends, ladies and gentlemen. So I don't want to pontificate or, or patronize you. But the fact of the matter is, you know, we live in the era, we live in the epoch of victimologists. That's very strange, isn't it bizarre? It's almost morbid sometimes. It seems that every nation, every ethnic group nowadays wants to resuscitate its dead. So you sometimes wonder what's wrong with you and my life, with, with people who are alive. You talk to any nation, in, be it in Africa, in Asia, um, any, any place, and somebody will tell you how, how, how they've suffered. For good reasons or for bad reasons, I cannot go into that because my mind simply cannot encompass this terrible suffering that has been going on. Again, when we look from the German side, again, again, we have this persistent question that this chunk of our history, and not just the German history, but if you wish, 
also the history of East European peoples who lived under communism from 45 until 85, uh, 89, 90. Uh, we also have to keep in mind that those folks had uh, victimology and their uh, body counts and of course there is a tendency sometimes to exaggerate their suffering but at least we have to, uh, to give them uh, some credit and, and at least examine what they are saying uh, and then uh, we can judge ourselves to what extent uh, uh, we can adopt it as a, as a historical narrative and later on take it into our history books. I don't want to bother you too much but just to give you an example of what I'm talking about. When Yugoslavia fell apart in 91, it, it's to some extent it's related. All history books, literally, in Croatia were thrown out, literally, were just thrown out. Because this communist historiogra historiography, or put it, hagiography, that sounds better, more ironical, was no longer considered true. All these communist myths about glorious, good-looking partisans saving the young kids and passing them chocolates, they just didn't, didn't hold the water any longer, you know. The people started asking questions. In 1992-93, simultaneously with another war going on, and we'll come back to that in a second, people all of a sudden were discovering what? Well, open up the newspapers yesterday, the Presse, the Austrian Presse, or Furche also, the Austrian-German, in the Zeit magazine, if you can read some German. What did you find? Barren bones. Every other day in Croatia, in that part of the Balkans, if you can see it down there, it's close to Slovenia, close to Hungary. Yes, there are mass pits being discovered. Croatia is a beautiful country. You can see it on CNN, those spots. You can see Slo Slovenia is a marvelous country. But literally, and this is not a joke, I'll tell you some of the stories. When I was a young boy, we would discover German helmets. We would discover German bones. And of course, this was a no-no zone. We would not talk about this in public. Why? Because this was a felony. We're not supposed to talk about crimes against the Germans. We're supposed to talk the crime about the crimes by the Germans. So, you know, just look at the pa in a passive tense and not in an active tense. So that's the problem, my ladies, ladies and gentlemen, with victimologists. Victimologists, as good as they are, even this good one of my fellow Germans, of my fellow colleagues, there is always a, a, a risk that one vict victimology clashes with another one. Because each victimology has what? On a philosophical level, if you allow me. It has its culprit. So unfortunately, if you look worldwide now, these victimologists do not lead, and this is my first, con my first con concluding remark, do not lead to more understanding and to more you know, multi-ethnic understanding and more tolerance. They lead to what? To more hatred and to more resentment. Precisely because this chapter of the history where the Germans suffered in what was ex-communist Yugoslavia from 45 until 48, and precisely because those tallies, those body counts, had, had never been mentioned by the Yugoslav historians, Yugoslav media, resulted in what? In this terrible war between Serbs, Croats, and, Slovene, uh, and, uh, and Bosnians. Let me just back up and rephrase it a little bit. Or let me put it conditionally. Had the Croats, the Croatian government, the Serbian government, and the Bosnian government, had they been aware, had we, had we known as high school boys back in communist Yugoslavia where went to school about those horrible crimes that were committed against the Germans, probably those ruling elites, ruling class, and probably all those intellectuals, court intellectuals, if you would, court historians would have thought twice about launching the war in ex-communist Yugoslavia, or for that matter, engaging in such a stupid and bloody war uh, among, between three very similar peoples. So much, ladies and gentlemen, about this introductory remark. I know I could talk about this, and seriously, I would love to talk about this for the entire <laughs> semester. But let me just make a little uh, detour, if I may, for our students, because, of course, we live in a, in a real world. We don't live in a surreal, well, unfortunately, we do in a surreal world. But those things happened on the ground. And I would just like my students especially, and I'm appealing to them, to take a quick look at Europe, just real briefly, in five minutes. So what do you see? The first question, if I was you, would be, if I was not of German or Christian origin, would be, how come the Germans were scattered all over Eastern Europe? What prompted those people to travel to Kazakhstan?